Think Tech Hawaii and Perspectives on Energy. This is your host, Guillermo Sabatier. And joining us today, we have Jim Stanton. He's a subject matter expert on NERC compliance at, here at HSI. And today we'll be discussing some of the challenges being faced by this, these inverter-based resources and some of these NERC changes. Jim, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, this is a hot topic that we deal with almost on a daily basis and helping folks figure out how they need to get situated with adding a uh, inverter-based resource to their existing generation site, which is happening a lot. And uh, so there are ways to go about doing it that are fairly painless if you take a look at what you need to do ahead of time. So hopefully we'll accomplish that here today. Hopefully. Thank you. And this also is 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 like a summary of a of a, of a webinar you and I held a few months ago. So we figured it'd be a good opportunity to share it here with everybody else. And hopefully if they have any questions, we can actually answer those on either comments or emails, comments that they leave in the video or emails they can send us. So always happy to help. All right. So so uh Jim, what what brought this what brought this on? Uh, these particular standards that are changing and, and, and this is these challenges with integrating battery energy storage systems into a generating facility. I, I think it's the, the sheer numbers. Uh, we knew this was coming. Uh, battery storage is a critical component of um, make it for the reliability of the grid, um, especially with coupled with existing generators. Um, it, it changes. You have an existing generator site and you add a battery storage facility to it, it changes it somewhat. It changes the scope, it changes capability, it can change the ratings, it expands the scope of your protection system, maintenance and testing, which are all good things uh, to get this new technology integrated seamlessly into what you're doing. So for people that have an existing plant, they already have programs in place. They don't have to start from scratch. It's a matter of doing some modifications to making sure these facilities are properly accounted for, and you have a seamless transition into reliability for their operation. Right, right. And, and really, really documentation is the key, right? Whether it's the day is commissioned, and a lot of these, in a lot of these cases, it's, it's working really closely with your contractor and actually holding them accountable to make sure they give you all the documentation. And and, and really what, what happened too is that this is, goes along with the whole um, NERC lowering the threshold, right? From, I believe it was 75 MVA down to like 20 and from 100 KV down to like, I believe 50, right? Or 60 KV for, for interconnection with some of these like inverter-based resources. Yeah, that's going to cast a lot wider net into the um, the scope of facilities that need to be registered and protected or for their owners to be registered actually. And so we did that's been coming for a long time. It's such a critical mass of these types of um, systems that are coming online. And you know, in a lot of ways, uh, they're more dependable, um, more predictable. They last longer. They're obviously cleaner. So uh, you know, altogether, it's a good thing. But we just want to make sure that they, once again, operate seamlessly. And in this case, we're talking about here if they're with their co-located facility right. and what kind of changes the owner can look at as far as getting them up and running and properly integrated into their compliance program. Mm -hmm. And then... And the end of the day, the reason they 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 enforce this compliance is because you want them to operate reliably, so they don't affect the uh, bulk electric system. You, you don't want these resources, for example, a while back where they, they changed their whole uh, right through characteristic requirements to make sure they they wouldn't like just um, quit whenever you had either a voltage or a frequency excursion, or even stop giving output during during like a a, a system fault that wasn't anywhere near where they were at which is we've had those problems before. So this is an example of yet another change, right? Uh, when it comes to the regulatory environment. So tell me more about these like uh, modified startup approach that we're seeing on this slide here. There's two different ways to manage this, right? Uh, we, we talk about having processes and procedures in place, which everybody does mm -hmm. if you are currently within scope of registering. And like you mentioned a while ago, that, that threshold is gonna fall um, shortly. Uh, from 75 to 20 megawatts for an existing facility um but we have they have programs in place for uh, around generator owners and operators which are are not terrible 
Uh, mm -hmm. They're pretty easy to comply with if you're paying attention to them. But now if you're adding something, it's like adding a modification to your car that's going to make it run a little bit differently. And so around the uh, system protection, uh, critical infrastructure protection, communications, outage coordination, those type of things um, are going to have to be factored into your processes and procedures so that your new facility is properly accounted for and is mm -hmm. operating seamlessly with your existing generator. And that's really, it's it, it, it's the whole existing procedure update is an example there, right? And really to account for a lot of the different standards, you just to name a few, right? Tell me more about that SIP communications and even the TOP003 standard. Right? Exactly. I mean, we're talking about uh, you're going to be putting something inside your physical security perimeter, um, your electronic security perimeter, if you have a certain threshold in place. Um, the people will need access um, to those facilities to service them to the jet or to the battery storage um, facilities. So they will be coming into the physical security perimeter and going through all the proper controls to make sure that the people getting in are the right ones that need to be there and that they're doing what they need to be to be doing and only that. So once again, those programs are in place from the current critical infrastructure protection processes. You're just adding to it and basically putting more things in the bucket that those processes need to address. And let's also not forget about the whole training requirement, right? Well, here we're, we're still talking about even more requirements, EOP4, EOP11, and the FAC requirements. But like uh, this even touches the whole training requirement for some, for some of the operators and even the personnel on site. It really does. It, it's in a sense, it's, it's doubling the amount of facilities they have to keep up with, mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. It's still located where you are. It's just they can just have the um, look forward to assuring that when something is happening with the batteries, especially when they're discharging, they are for all intents and purposes a generator on the system. So anything that applies to an operating generator is going to apply to them. Right. And the way they respond to disturbances is is really what was paramount here. Exactly. And and it, it goes on, right? Look at all these different like like we've gone through four slides already of like different procedures. Uh, each, each of them showing the four or five procedures. I'm, I'm sorry, four or five standards each that they're going to have different there's gonna touch on different requirements whenever these resources are commissioned. So all of that is, is in itself an, an integration challenge for some of these uh, BE, BESSs, I mean, battery storage uh, resources. Right, and a good point for this communication about those those type of issues are the, the logging that needs to be done. And um, it's just going to say, okay, I usually communicate about the condition and um, the status of my current generator. Now I need to communicate about the status of my battery storage right. facility when it is producing as well. So it's right. a little bit more and, work, same same type of work, just a little bit larger scope. Right. And, and and really, if if they had everything done correctly, which they should, from the time it was commissioned, even though it may not have been part of these the the, the compliance scope in the past, I mean, they should have everything they already need. They should have everything they need already just to, exactly. to meet this compliance need. Mm -hmm. If they did their proper due diligence, right, from an, from an engineering commissioning standpoint, I mean, a lot of these requirements really are, uh, uh, it's easier to manage if you already have an existing generating facility. It's a little tougher when you got something brand new starting somewhere and you've got many hands in the pot. That's where I've seen some of the, some of the, some of the gaps appear. Exactly. In some cases, right. Because, and again, it still goes on, right, with a lot of like, the different uh, standards requiring procedure update. So there's a lot of existing procedures that can be updated in this case, but that will have to be updated. And especially with the uh, the protection and control uh, standards and all those requirements, right? So that's another interesting thing when it comes to these, uh, these, these particular resources. Can you tell us more about that? Right, so as far as the PRC and the misoperations, that's reported quarterly now, if you have an operation of a protection system component. So obviously you're going to have more of those. You're going to have components that protect your battery storage facility, just like it was a generator. So that's going to add to that. Um, doesn't happen a lot, um, but when it does, you need to make sure that the operation was correct, that it wasn't a misoperation and that the relays didn't respond to something that wasn't actually happening. Same with sequence of events recorders and fault recorders. If you've been designated to have those at your site, 
um, that that will be another type of operation that would need to be reported and kept track of and um, kept in the log books. Um, the VAR, the uh, voltage and reactive, the schedule coordination for reactive output. So now you're going to have two facilities that are doing that, and your standard generator and your battery storage. So that you, your voltage schedule probably won't change for your site, but the equipment that's producing that reactive power is going to be two different, basically, facilities. So that needs to be kept up with and make sure that schedule is being kept and the proper communication that happens when it can't be, uh, when something happens or during a startup or a shutdown, that right. you have close communication with your transmission operator and let them know where you are as per your reactive production capability. And then you mentioned contractors and vendors. And this has been a big issue mm -hmm. for data that needs to be uh, incorporated, reported, um, if ride through capabilities for voltage. Frequency is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, you need to make sure that you have all that information up front when your facility is being built. We said <clears throat> with the um, existing facilities, and now you've got the batteries facilities coming up, it's the same thing. You need to make sure you have a full set of the capabilities for what those um, pieces of equipment can do, because to come back to the contractor after the fact is a lot of times it's really hard to say, hey, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I need to know what this setting is, and I need to know what this capability is. So make sure that you get that and incorporate it into your request uh, for proposals when you're bidding it out and make sure you put that in there so that becomes part of the contract. Right, and and, and that is an interesting thing, right? Where that, that sort of thing can be staggered, uh, holding the contractor accountable. Okay, I'll give you this percentage where you get this far, but you're not gonna get full payment until I get all of my required compliance documentation, you know, right before commissioning date, which is a way exactly. to hold them accountable for that. Yeah, it all comes down to evidence. Mm -hmm. um, about documents and commissioning dates and so forth, which tends to set the uh, the timing for future things. Right. And then, of course, it's what everybody, every, everyone must remember is it's the commissioning date for that particular facility is the date where the clock starts ticking for compliance. You're 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 basically um, on the hook from that date forward for any action, any evidence, or or anything that, that they may actually ask for uh, for a compliance, for the time range for compliance evidence, you know, the, going mm -hmm. all the way back to that commissioning date. Yeah, that's where that coordination comes in. If you have an existing facility and a protection system maintenance and testing program in place, you have to perform those operations, that, that testing, every so many years, depending on what the capabilities of your system is. But the clock starts ticking on that time window when you have to do that upon your commissioning date. So if you have an existing facility and you've had it for two years, and that's fine, and you're going to add battery storage, then that facility is going to have protections as well with relays. And so that commissioning date is going to start a different clock. Right. So you have a, you have a decision to make. I'm going to have two clocks running, or I'm just going to integrate it into what I have. Um, so it just depends on um, basically a lot of how, how many facilities you have, who does the testing, how difficult is it. It might not be a big deal, or it might be easier to just do them all at once and just put everybody on the same schedule, both both the facilities. But it should be no different really than, than adding an additional generator, conventional generator to an existing generating facility instead of having two generators, now you got a third. It really is no different than that, I think. Exactly. So, right. So now it it just it, it's a different source, it's a different te technology, but it's still the same commissioning dates, requirement needs. I mean, even I can imagine with the VAR uh, requirements that we have, for example, an AVR in the voltage schedule. They, uh, I imagine these IVRs probably have some kind of AVR function, automatic voltage regulation. Absolutely, they do. And right, I mean, I don't know about power system stabilizers. But I imagine there's something in there like that as well, where they have certain requirements when it comes to maintaining that. That tends to be a software module that you can right. have and acquire if you need it. Yes. Interesting stuff. So um, same thing with the whole PR PRC 005, you know, just, just got into that compliance, that, and that was a conversation we just had. And, um, and again, it's just 
evidence, I mean, evidence is key. Your documentation is key. And that's the only way you're going to prove compliance, right? Those test records need, need to be at the correct date, correct window, and everything has to be examined and tested prior to commissioning. Usually. Yeah, starting with your commissioning date, um, that would, the commissioning paperwork will be, the, once again, the start of that timing window for when you have to um, test and maintain your relays and your PC, PTs and CTs, um, communications systems within your uh, protective devices. But um, when you have, now from then on, then you need, it tends to be work orders that you prove, okay, now the next round of when my window comes up and I need to test and maintain them again, tend to be work orders and that's fine. So then you get a new facility added into the mix and you have a different commissioning date. And so, okay, that starts that. And then, okay, it would be more efficient just to get the battery um, system into your existing work order flows and say, okay, we just need to add it. We need to make these modifications. And underlying all of this is it's not a reliability standard, but it's something that gets asked by auditors a lot. Show me the change management system that you employed to make sure all of this equipment was integrated correctly, the training was done, the procedures were revised. So be ready for that is um, be ready to demonstrate that your change management process was put in place and mm -hmm. that it worked. And, that, and that's really one of your controls. So to speak. Yeah. Only controls there. And now going back to the whole standalone versus integration, right? It, it, it's it tell me more about this difference here when it comes to managing this challenge. Yeah, we're seeing both. I mean, I looked just before I got on this call, and here where I live in ERCOT in Texas, there are 500 interconnection requests for um co-located facility battery facilities right now in the queue 500 wow and that doesn't include uh, like we talked about uh the standalone mm -hmm. now those are basically just generators they right. operate a little bit differently the communication around them can change because not only are they generators they're also loads for the time periods when they're charging Mm -hmm. So that communication back and forth with the balancing authority or the system operator, wherever you are, you have to make sure you have that done and accounted for. But um, we have we have both things going on. And I, th I think the standard loans are a little simpler. And the main difference is, is basically how they operate. They are loads and generators at the same mm -hmm. time. And we have a lot of... Um, discussion around ancillary services and so forth about how these facilities, they can come on and respond so quickly for right. imbalance energy and frequency response and so forth. And so, I, I you know, it's an exciting time. I, I think overall, once we get the critical mass in place, I believe the grid's going to be um, a lot more reliable and predictable than it is now. Right, and and, and you know, it's gone through its growing pains. Whether whether the way that and really what it was is just it's it's it wasn't really des design issues. It was more like a software issue. The way they set that protection up, right, where it it wasn't staying online during a disturbance uh, in an area not even nearby. So that has definitely changed, and they are a lot more resilient uh, than they were in the past. So uh, it's a matter of staying online and still producing output, and you know, in spite of uh, uh, fault on a line somewhere or disturbances. So be behaving a little more like like, like these conventional generators with some like what they call synthetic inertia. It's interesting. So. Exactly. So <laughs> here's the other important thing: right? commissioning dates, and so sometimes as as you may not build the whole site all at once, you may you may have, for example, different commissioning dates for each battery bank system. Um, can you tell me more about the this whole, for example, weird the uh, different uh, testing dates and compliance dates and that sort of thing with these commissions? Yeah, we touched on that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> once again, if you're adding a facility like this to an existing site, you already have a plan in place. You have a protection mm -hmm. system, maintenance and testing document. If you're in compliance with the PRC 005 standard, you have that document and you're using it. So that's going to need to be revised. The list of equipment that's included in your protection plan is going to change mm -hmm. because you're going to have new protective devices that are there. Um, and we're talking state-of-the-art um, 
protection packages, a lot of software, mm -hmm. um, easily programmable, easily tracked, easily documented, and that's great. You know, it's not the old the relay going out and trudging around in the switch yard with their meter and with the with the old type of relays and checking them with a screwdriver. It's not like that anymore. It's a lot more efficient. But right. you have to remember that if if these new facilities are going to be part of your existing plan, you need to modify it. Right. If you don't want it to be part of your existing plan for whatever reason, then you need to have a plan specific right. for them as far as the maintenance and testing and the curiosity, which does commence on the commissioning dates. Right. And not to say that if you have like a six year window and you have an existing generator you've had for two years and you add a battery storage facility on year three, it can fall within that window and then you can test everything again in the next three years and just have everything on the same schedule, which right. what most people are doing. Um, it just takes some amending of your procedures and a change of the list of the components and make sure that that change management process catches everything and everybody needs to be notified from contractors to operators. Right. And that is an important way and probably a much better way of doing it as well. So and and of course the rating scope changes with that as well. So that's the thing as they're as they're adding more equipment and they're commissioning more more equipment out there, right? Uh, they are going to actually have additional capacity, and and, and that changes the the entire FAC FAC uh, rating scope. Where we're now you know hey which is your which is your weakest link as one example in this case. Yeah, it it can change it. It doesn't have to. If you're one of the facilities that are using battery storage to re to run when your primary generator isn't, it's probably not going to change a whole lot of your facility or your facility ratings that affect the grid. But the list of components that have to be considered when calculating that facility rating are going to change because there's going to be uh, new connecting lines, um, maybe a new transformer, and uh, that's going to be on the list. That may not change it a lot, but you have to make darn sure that you account for it and that you have painted the proper picture of your site um, for the auditors. And um, once again, change management is key. So the facility ratings, they have a component list just like the protection system maintenance and testing. A lot of times they look a, a lot of like, uh, they're not identical. But again, just something you have to be aware of. You're gonna have to look at it and see uh, uh, how much needs to change and um, make sure it happens. Mm -hmm. and, and and again, the benefit of these these uh, facilities is like a lot of them are modular; they're identical. So it's a matter of adding more of them, right? It, it's as long as you're within the capacity of that substation, you, you usually or that switch, or you're tying them to. It's adding more of these components is 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 it's not too difficult because they usually have the same identical nameplate rating. Right. So we we've seen um, several folks that when they initially designed their site. They added extra interconnection capacity. Right. Thinking down the road, they're going to add battery storage, so they already have that there. So they can run their existing either wind farm or solar facility, and if they get called on and they have uh, storage in the battery, they can discharge as well and add to their output because they've already accounted for that. Right. Exactly. And of course, again, let's not forget, we did mention this earlier, but it is always a training requirement. And there is a PER 006 standard that involves generator operators having to have training on how these components uh, affect the system, right? Can you tell us more about this, Jim, and what you've seen? Yeah, the, the, the standard says you have to be aware of the purpose and limitations of your protection system right. and how you can expect your facility to respond uh, if certain things happen on the grid, and you mentioned the uh, the under voltage, under frequency ride through, that's a big one. Um, and we're still kind of nailing down the issues and the details around that about what can be expected and what can be documented and what can be proven for some of these newer facilities. So that training falls into that. Uh, and if you're part of a uh, special protection scheme, that when you're your facility will accept a redispatch from the transmission operator based on certain conditions on the grid, which you may or may not know anything about, but that's fine. But you know that if that happens, that, okay, that's part of not just protecting your generator, but it's your generator contributing to protecting the grid and for whatever uh, sort of maybe temporary flows are happening on the grid. Um, 
in response to a contingency. So, yeah, all of that. And once again, it's not, not creating something new. It's modifying something you have to make sure these new facilities are integrated into the process. Thank you. And that is all we have today, but it, it's it's a very quick summary of that webinar we had, but it's, and again, it, it's, it's, it's uh, for these facilities, right? It's like no need to panic, right? If there's a, a lot of stuff that's already in place that they probably have, have already done and is ready, you know, so as they begin to integrate, integrate these uh, resources into the existing generator operations, right? It's not too difficult to accomplish. Right. It's exciting times. So they sure are, especially now that they lowered they lowered the threshold for compliance. Again, th this is going to cast a wider net, and a lot more of them will be will be impacted. So, always happy to help, and uh, we're always here available for any questions. So, Jim, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again as a guest on some more topics and more shows. Uh, definitely value your input and your experience and expertise in this matter. So, once again, thank you for joining us here, here thank today. Thank you. Thanks to Kauai, perspectives on energy. Mm -hmm.